Now, let's dive into our second study. Remember that we have this fiery young zealot named Gunther. Amen? And remember his boldness, he sees Poncho eating by himself. And so he just, you know, he gets it up by the power of the Spirit and he sits down. He starts talking to them. They, hit, they get a great conversation, start building a friendship. And then he gets them to church and the guy is flat fired up. He's never seen a church like this. Amen? Amen. Now, if the person that you're studying with has no real faith in Christ, then you're going to start with what book? John. Book of John. And you want to go through it in a quick clip. I think a mistake some people do is say, well, we'll just go one or two chapters this week, one two. No, no, no. You want to go through on a daily or every other day uh, pattern. You want to really build faith from this eyewitness account that the Holy Spirit has inspired. Amen? Amen. Now, if they have a basic faith in Jesus Christ, then you start with what study? But well, we could be a lot more deeply crazy. If they have a basic faith, you start with what study? Amen. And, of course, you're calling them to seek after God. Now, in our studies, we, we tried to reiterate just how important it was to begin every study with prayer. Yeah. Because this isn't a matter of us trying to convert someone. We want God to move in their hearts right. through the Scriptures. Amen? Amen. Secondly, we, we want to get them familiar with the Scriptures themselves. And so... When we go through these studies, very often we'll let perhaps the young Christian Gunther do the first reading, and then we'll have a little discussion, and then we'll let uh, Poncho do the second reading, have a little discussion, then I'll do the third reading as the older Christian do a little discussion, and we'll trade off like this. You say, what's the value of that? Well, it gets the person into the Word of God where he really does believe that he can understand it for himself. So many people are intimidated by it. And this gets them into it, and it produces faith a lot faster when they feel comfortable with it. Thirdly, either the young Christian or you take notes. Now, the, the, the thing about taking notes is this. Yes, you can come in there with a pre-written out page. But I'm telling you, it genuinely impresses someone when you know the scriptures by memory. Yeah. And you go through that and say, Wow! Man, your church knows the Bible. Do you see what I'm saying right here, guys? And so when I study with someone, I just take out my yellow pad and I just put the title of the lesson, and in this case it would be the Word of God, date it, and then I just write out the Scripture and just a couple comments, just very similar to what's in the notes right here. But by having that, it, it allows the person then to take it and to be able to go back and read it for themselves so that they really understand, hey, this is not Kip's convictions. This is not Gunther's convictions. This is what God is saying to me. Are you with me right here, guys? So that's the situation. Now, um, let's get into the Word of God study. But let's start with a word of prayer. Amen. Father God, thank you so much that we can be gathered here tonight. Uh, sometimes, Heavenly Father, you come to Wednesday night and... It's a little bit of a, a challenge, a grind to the week. And yet it's just so great to come together with the brothers and sisters. Yeah. Father, I pray if we did great in the quiz that we feel commended by you. Uh, if we didn't really do so hot, Heavenly Father, that we feel inspired to do better the next time. Right Heavenly yeah. Father, help us get serious about this course. Because it really is going to help us in our salvation to become mature. And secondly, we want other people to have what we have. Father, we want to pray for Bring Your Neighbor Day, that we have boldness, that you use us, Heavenly Father, and just bring us into different people's lives, and that we have so many visitors on Sunday. Amen. Father, I pray that we can even begin to use the Seeking God study, even yet this Sunday, with our non-Christian friends. Father, thank you for this time. Bless our study tonight. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Now, Something that's also important that we talked about last time is you don't want to take two hours to go through these studies. You want to try to keep the study, even with discussion, under an hour. The only exception is the light and darkness study. And we'll be talking more about that. Amen? 
Secondly, you want to try to certainly explain each scripture out, but you want to, as you go through each scripture, in a gentle way, call that person to a decision on that scripture. Don't wait till the end before you have any call to decision. Now, at the end, you are going to call them to make a decision. Amen? Amen. But, at the same time, you want to go through it, and you really want to say, okay, have a conviction about this. Now, the other thing we talked about is that you need to be in great spiritual shape. You don't want to present the Word of God in a boring way. Amen? Because if you present the Word of God in a boring way, what is it? Because the Word of God is flat exciting. Amen? Amen? It changes people's lives. It changes their eternal destiny. But well, here we are with Gunther and Poncho. It's great to be back together. Amen. Amen. And uh, it's great that we got a chance to be able to start with a prayer. And so what we're going to do right here tonight, uh, Poncho, is we're going to study the Word of God. Now, let me ask you a question. How how'd you feel going back on the Seeking God study? Did you study back through it? Oh, you did? Great. That's, that's really awesome. What, what really just uh, was awesome for you going back over... The Seeking God Study. Well, I just see I have to change my priorities. I said, well, all of us had to do that in order to really become a true follower of Jesus Christ. Anything else stick out? Well, I see that God's working in my life, and that's why he brought me to this church, and that's why I got a chance to meet Gunther. God, God is working. That, that's kind of weird to me in a way, but, but I, I really do feel like it's God. I said, amen, that's awesome. Well, tonight we're going to build on that study, and we're going to do a study on the Word of God. I'm going to take notes for you like I did before, and I'll note the Scriptures, a few little notes aside, and then you'll be able to have them uh, when we close on out. Now, let's uh, start out. Gunther, you want to get the first one? 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Gunther, get this one, please. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, now, right here, Pancho, what stands out? Well, I guess, Kip, uh, what stands out to me is that, well, that God wants us to be thoroughly equipped. Okay, well, that's, that's good, and that's, that's true. Let's, let's look at the first part of the Scripture here. Um, he starts out, and, 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 and Paul is talking to Timothy right here, and he says, all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is inspired by God. Is that exciting? Yep. Yep. And it isn't just this inspirational literature. But the Bible says, right here, Pancho, that it's useful. Now, what are the things that's useful for? He says, well... It's useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Well, what, what are those things? Well, um, I, I, you know, I guess, Kip, I've never seen the Bible as being really practical. I said, yeah, you know what you're going to find out in the next series of studies is that it is super practical. As a matter of fact, the intent of Scripture is that it is useful. It is to be applied to our lives. You know, the thing that, uh, you know, Pancho is kind of interesting. Uh, I, I had a little Bible that my, my Grammy gave me when I was five years old. Had a picture of Jesus with little kids on it. And, uh, you know, I had that Bible for years and years and years. And I, and I honestly super treasured my little Bible. But I never read it. So I treasured the Bible, but I just never read it. But we see right here in the Scriptures... That the Bible is inspired by God, and we should be applying it to our lives. Amen? Amen. Well, let's move on. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. And guys, the study builds very simply on itself. In Hebrews 4, Pancho, why don't you get this one? We're going to be reading in verses 12. And 13, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than the devil's sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must 
give account. Well, now right here, class, we see that it starts out, it says, the Word of God is living and active. You know, for a lot of people, they think that the Word of God is just some antiquated, ancient manuscript. Right. And yet the Bible says of itself that it is living and active. You know, I remember many, many years ago when I had a, a Bible study that I hosted in my fraternity room, uh, I had a guy that, that, that came to Bible talk. And at my fraternity house, we had Bible talk at 10 o'clock on Monday night. And uh, sometimes the guys did not always come in there the sharpest. This one guy, one night, came in there kind of drunk, to be very honest. And yet, you know, he didn't say anything during the Bible talk. And, you know, during the Bible talk, he, you know, kind of chilled out. But it started getting his attention a little bit. And we talked to him after the Bible study. And we just simply challenged him. and said, hey, Bill, you know, um, it would really be awesome if uh, you would read the book of John. It will really help you with your faith. And he didn't say much. But the next week he came back. Except this time he wasn't drunk. He was dressed a lot nicer, hair combed. I mean, and kind of perked up and everything. And uh, it was kind of interesting because then after the Bible study, I said, what did you think of the Bible study? He says, this was great. I said, did you get a chance to, by chance to read the book of John? He says, yeah, I, I did. It kind of like shook me up a little bit because, you know, honestly, Kiff, I, I was reading the book of John. I was reading the Bible to try to figure God out. He says, as I read it, I saw that God had figured me out. And you know something? It's, it's not uncommon, is it? We have people come to church, and maybe even ourselves, we come to church, and the preacher preaches something, and we go, oh my goodness, he was following me around all week. You see, the Word of God is living and active. There's no other book like it. Nothing close. It's amazing. And we've got to put that sense of awe and amazement and life in the people that we're studying with. Well, now it goes on right here, Poncho. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates. It cuts. You know, one of the things that is interesting, Poncho, is that when you read the Word of God, it sometimes cuts us. It convicts us. And you know, a lot of times, we can have the attitude, oh my goodness, this is too challenging. This is cutting too deep. And so what we do? We just push it away. We close it. We don't want to experience the pain of the Word of God speaking to us. But you know, one of the things that I, that I really try to get people to understand about the Word of God is, perhaps today swords are not uh, too common for us to use, but, you know, we are familiar with uh, doctors. You know, you got this show, Nip and Tuck, you know, on and everything. It's about plastic surgery. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the favorite instrument of the surgeon is like a scalpel. It's like a knife. And for most of us, if they said, hey, would you like to go in for some surgery. Most of us go, oh, absolutely not. Like most of us guys, we don't even want to come close to a doctor, do we? I mean, when was the last time you went to a doctor? When was the last time you went to the dentist? You know what I'm talking about right here? (laughs) Because we just don't want the pain. We don't want anybody cutting on us. But you know, if someone told us today, hey, Kip, yesterday we got an x-ray, we found a malignant tumor, in your brain, or a poncho that found a malignant tumor in your brain, and they say, would you like surgery? And we would go, what? Absolutely. Because we realize that the surgery is essential for saving our life. Poncho, you've got to understand that as you read the Word of God, it is going to cut. It's going to hurt. It's going to be... Not just like a sword, but like a scalpel. And the whole point of going under the scalpel is to be able to cut the cancer out that would take your life away. See, that's what the Word of God does. It, it convicts us of sin. It convicts us of those things that hurt our life, that harm our life, that destroy our life. 
And so instead of having an attitude, oh no, the, the Word of God is convicting me. The Word of God is cutting me. I don't want to read anymore. We go, oh, thank you, God. I appreciate the fact that it's cutting me, that it's challenging me, because I know that it's going to give me life by cutting the sin out. Amen, guys? Amen. Now, that's a very important principle to teach the people that you're studying because, you know, they're, they're just new to doing these studies and everything and they need to have a sense that, okay, if they get challenged, that's not bad, that's good. Are you with me right here? And that way they're not going to run. Let's keep going. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 20. Now, from here on out, I'll just continue to read all the scriptures, but you understand that we'd be trading around the reading all the way through the study. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 20. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is kind of interesting right here is what Peter's saying. He says, above all. He says, man, if you missed everything else, catch this. Are you with me right here, guys? Right. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. What does he mean by that? He's saying, when Jeremiah writes down his prophecies, when Isaiah gives his prophecies, this isn't Jeremiah's ideas. This isn't Isaiah's ideas. This is God's ideas. This is from God. Now, of course, you're also going to run across a lot of issues from time to time, like, well, uh, that's just your interpretation. The one thing you need to teach right here, th there are different people that interpret things differently, but God has a very clear intent for every scripture. And that's what must be taught right here. The prophets weren't confused when they spoke. The apostles were not confused when they spoke. Jesus was not confused when he spoke. It's not a matter of that it's too hard to understand. It's that we don't want to understand. And so the idea of interpretation, you need to really hit hard right here, is that every scripture has an intent in the mind of God. Yes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and prophets, and apostles, and even Jesus himself spoke Scripture. But Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is from God. Amen? Amen. Let's go to John chapter 8. Now, of course, sometimes there's going to be a question or two as you go along, and you can answer them, but you don't want to get bogged down. You, you want to stay centered in on the study. As you can see, we're moving at a good clip right here. And John 8 is really one of the, the most famous of all the scriptures. Beginning in verse 31. To the Jews that believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I mean, we can all hear Martin Luther King crank on this one, can't we? Yeah. And you've got to admit, I mean, it just kind of sends a tingle. I mean, we've all heard this scripture before. But I mean, it just goes, wow, this is awesome. Then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I mean, wow, amen. It's good to know that Jesus said it first, amen? amen. Now, right here is a very fundamental teaching that is going to be a thread through all the rest of the studies. And what you ask Pancho is, number one, who is Jesus speaking to? Who is his audience? And you get various answers. Of course, the correct answer is, the Jews who believed in Jesus. They intellectually believed he was the Messiah. But in speaking to this group of people, he says, listen, that's not good enough to be a disciple, to just believe. Look what he says. If you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. And right here, I mean, this is, this is a great discussion point. 
There are a lot of people that believe that Jesus is the Messiah. There are a lot of people that believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior. Even the demons believe. Thank you. (laughs) But in order to be a disciple, Jesus says, you must hold, you must obey the Word of God. And that is a very definitive line that it's not that we're drawing it. God draws it. Are you with me right here, guys? Amen. Now, you know, another thing that I think is very important to hit off of this scripture is that a lot of people believe certain things. And one of the things that I've learned through the years is never challenge people's sincerity. If you get into that, that can get them upset over the wrong issue. Because a lot of people believe what they believe very, very sincerely. But we need to have a conviction and understanding that sincerity doesn't necessarily equal truth. Now, I am a huge football fan. I, I love football. I mean... Next Monday night, it is a cost to teach first principles when there's Monday night football on. But I'm coming. Amen? Amen. Now, you know, one of, one of my favorite teams, we're going through a little tough time right now, is the Dallas Cowboys. Amen. But I think all of us that are, that are true uh, football fans have experienced the following feeling. You see your favorite team line up right down by the goal line. You, you, you know that if they get this touchdown, they're going to go ahead and most likely win the game. They send the back through the line. The guy jumps over, and you're sitting there watching a TV set, and you see him going over the pile, and you're going, yes, yes, yes! You know, because you, you look at it and say, oh, man, he scored the touchdown. And then you look at the idiot referee who's not raising his hands. Go, What is wrong with that dude? Because, I mean, you know he scored a touchdown. Because you saw it. I mean, you you felt the excitement as he crossed the line. I mean, mean, you you really did feel that, the joy of victory. Well, you know, one of the things they got on TV these days, instant replay... And they show the instant replay, and you know something? When they show the instant replay, the referee was right. (laughs) And he didn't go over the goal line. Here's the point. You emotionally really did believe. You were very sincere in your faith (laughs) that he scored a touchdown. But the truth is, and the replay camera never lies, the truth is, is that even though you were very sincere and you were 100% sure, you were wrong. This is a very important teaching, guys. Sincerity does not equal truth. And so I always grant people sincerity. And as we study through then, that takes away that little edge But bottom line, I have a deep conviction as a disciple that a lot of people sincerely believe a lot of wrong things. But they need to see the truth. Amen? Are you with me right here? So we need to get a deep conviction that just because someone's sincere in their faith does not make them biblically a disciple. Amen? Let's move on. Let's go to Matthew 15, a very key scripture. It's going to take a little bit of digging to fully understand. Matthew 15, verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father and mother, whatever help you might otherwise receive from me is a gift devoted to God, 
he is not to honor his father with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Now, this scripture, you have to work a little bit to explain to the person that you're teaching. And you need to really understand this scripture super well. Now, right here, we find that the Pharisees that teach his law come to Jesus and they ask him kind of an interesting question. He says, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, maybe your mom has said the same thing to you. Now, here's a shock to your mom. Washing your hands is not a command in the Bible. Oh, oh baby. <laughs> but it is a tradition of the elders. Okay, now, we need to understand this. You've got to explain this to the person you're studying with. You have the Bible, and there were a lot of traditions then that were written down outside of the Bible. They may have been well intended. I mean, there really isn't anything wrong with washing your hands, is there? <laughs> but it's not in the Bible. But Jesus comes back, and He says to them, well, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? So now they, they, they are actually saying, hey, your disciples didn't wash their hands and they are breaking the tradition of the elders. They were breaking the tradition of the elders, but the tradition of the elders is not the scriptures. Amen? Right. But now Jesus turns it around and he says, well, now hold it, guys. Why are you breaking the command of God? by practicing the traditions that you practice. And he cites one in particular. He says, you know the scriptures. Honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Now that's pretty serious, isn't it right there? Amen. And then it says, whatever help you might otherwise receive from me is a gift devoted to God. He is not to honor his father with it. Now, right here. Under the tradition of the elders... They were allowed to, so to speak, honor their father and their mother in a shortcut way. The scriptures teach to honor your father and mother, which is much more than saying, Dad, you're great. Mom, you're awesome. To honor your father and your mother carries with it the weight of taking care of them, even when they get old. And if they live for a really, really long time... That could be a little bit of a financial burden. You see what I'm talking about right there? But the tradition of the elders, as all traditions do, try to shortcut things. And they said, to fulfill the scripture of honoring your father and your mother, all you need to do is give a one-time gift to the temple, Corbin, in the name of your father and your mother. And that'll get the job done. Now, which way is cheaper? Oh, yeah. Now, in effect, giving a one-time gift to the temple, does that really take care of your father and your mother? And so, in fact, this tradition of the elders was breaking the command of God. Do you see what he's saying right here? And Jesus says, in verse 6, Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. They're teachings about rules taught by men. Now let's talk for a second. There are two kinds of traditions. You know, we celebrate Thanksgiving. We celebrate Christmas. And I'm sure all you uh, high school and college students are looking forward to that already. Yes. Now, those are traditions that are fine. Summer. <laughs> the traditions of Thanksgiving and Christmas do not contradict the Word of God. And so they're okay for Christians to practice. You see what I'm saying? 
But if there is a tradition that contradicts the Word of God, then there are five things that Jesus says that's bad. Number one, if you are practicing a tradition that contradicts the Word of God, number one, you nullify the Word of God. Number two, you're a hypocrite. Do you see it in the Scriptures right there, guys? Number three, you're only honoring God with your lips. It's just you're paying God lip service. Number four, your heart is far away from God. And number five, your worship is in vain. What is something done in vain? You might as well not do it at all. Now, this is a huge teaching right here, guys. You are laying the base in this study for some of the challenging things that are be, going to be coming on up in the next few studies. You're laying the base, hold it, that you've got to be a disciple to be a Christian. You're laying the base that you've got to be baptized and immersed in water as an adult. A lot of people practice the tradition of infant baptism or praying Jesus in your heart. You don't go into these things. As a matter of fact, as they say, well, hold it. I noticed at your church that they baptized an adult the other day. Are you saying that, that my tradition is wrong? Say, you know something, we'll cross that bridge in a couple of weeks. You don't want to get into it. You want to build the foundation right here. And you want to get them to a conviction. I am going to go by the Word of God. No matter what. And I realize that if I go by the traditions of men, then I will be as Jesus accused the Pharisees. I will be a person that nullifies the word of God, a hypocrite, someone that pays God lip service. My heart is far away from God and my worship is in vain. See, we have to have a deep conviction that when a individual or a group worships God in traditions that contradict the word of God, its worship is in vain. That's tough teaching, guys. Are you with me right here? Are you you solid right here? Now, you're not going to go detail anything. All you're doing is laying the foundation. Now, next week, in the quiz, I would say there'd be a real good chance that you would need to know the five ways that Jesus condemns the worship in the traditions of men versus the Word of God. That would be good to know. Amen, guys? Amen. Let's go to 1 Timothy, chapter 4, in verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Now, this is just a short little verse, but it carries a huge impact. When you read this scripture to your friend, after you read it, it says right here, obviously, that life and doctrine are important. We're supposed to watch it closely. Now, Pancho, which do you think is the most important? And you'll be surprised. Sometimes people say, well, doctrine, because you've got to be right. Or sometimes people will say, well, your life, because your life just really counts. And, of course, you've got to come back to it and say, listen, they're both important. It's like saying, which wing of an airplane is more important? I don't know about you, but when I fly, I like to see both of them out there. You see what I'm talking about? The same thing is true. You want your life. And your doctrine. Are you with me here, church? Now, a lot of people don't fully understand the impact in this. Understand. He is saying that if you don't watch your life, you will not save yourself and your hearers. He is saying if you don't watch your doctrine, you will not save yourself or your hearers. This is huge, guys. We're talking a matter of salvation. We have to have deep convictions on this. What's it mean? Well, if you don't watch your life, if your life is just like everybody else's, are you going to be saved? Absolutely not. Now, if your life is like everybody else, and you try to save by preaching the word to other people, is anybody going to listen to you? No. So they're not going to be saved, are they? Now, your doctrine. Doctrine is essential for salvation. It says if you're practicing the wrong doctrine, are you going to save yourself? 
Well, what if you teach the wrong doctrine? They're not going to be saved. As a matter of fact, that, that was the thing with me. I mean, I was very open when I was between 10th and 11th grade in high school. And I, I really did, quote, want to become a follower of Christ. And they had this kind of this altar call at the Methodist Church with a group of college students. And I just came forward and they just kind of showed me, hey, uh, all you need to do is just pray Jesus in your heart and you're good to go. And so I, I sincerely prayed Jesus into my heart. Sadly enough, I taught that to other people. Yeah. I taught that to other people, thinking that I was saved and thinking they were saved. Now, you don't go into that story for your non-Christian friend right here, but I want you to have deep convictions of just how important it is to watch your life and your doctrine. For by it, you'll save yourself and your hearers. Amen, church? Amen. Let's go back to Acts 17, 10 through 12. Notice we have this scripture again. In verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as also did a number of prominent Greek women, and many... Greek men. Now, right here, you'd be talking to Poncho. Say, Poncho, you remember this scripture from last week? Prayerfully, he says, yes, amen. <laughs> and so, what do you remember about it? Well, prayerfully, he remembers that what it really means to have a noble character is that you've got to receive the message with eagerness. You know, and you know how it is. You know, when you bring a visitor to church and they hear the word of God and they're fired up, doesn't that fire you on up? go, wow, this person's got a special heart. Secondly, we challenge our membership as well as those that attend to learn more about God. You need to examine the scriptures to test out, in this particular case, to see if what Paul said was true. And the Bible goes on to say, it says, well, we do this every day. You see, that's why we encourage every single member to have a Bible with them on Sundays or whenever we gather. That's why we encourage every single member to take notes during the sermon. We're just not trying to give you busy work. Right. <laughs> you need to understand, yeah, we, we always will have well-intentioned people speaking. But just because they're well-intentioned doesn't necessarily mean that what they're saying is the truth. Even me. Right. They were checking out Paul. So I feel fine if you're checking out me. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the bottom line that you've got to explain to people. If indeed what the preacher is saying is true, then it's not the preacher that's saying it. It is God. It is, in fact, God speaking to you. Oh, and so right here you've got to get into a little discipling. Hey, Pancho, since the last time that we studied, have you been studying the Scriptures every day? Now, most of the people I study with, uh-uh. <laughs> they haven't. So, well, I, I did go back on the notes the other day, and that was, that was really awesome, Kip, you know, trying to you know, make good. No, 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 no. <laughs> we said the noble charactered person examines the Scriptures daily. What, you know, honestly, Pancho, what, why didn't you do it? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I tried to, but, you know, the alarm. Like, one morning, it just didn't go off. And another morning, it went off, but I didn't hear it. And to make a long story short, I just, the third morning, I just didn't want to get up. And I figured, well, I'll get a little bit at church. I hope that doesn't describe anybody in here. Now, I'm just, I'm just going to go fishing a little bit right here. If you didn't get a perfect score, I don't think it's because you don't have the IQ of Larry Scipione. None of us got that. I think it's because you weren't in the Scriptures every day. 
Now, if you just made a careless mistake, bag it. That's okay. Careless mistake, that's okay. But if you're studying the Scriptures diligently every day, you're going to know the first principle stuff. Now, the same thing is true. What are we trying to do when we study with someone? We are trying to make a disciple. No one is naturally a disciple. Everybody needs, yes, God, yes, the Scriptures, but human beings getting in there and making them a disciple. The process itself is humbling. We all must humble ourselves to another man in order to come into the kingdom. Is that pretty cool, guys? And so right here is your chance to do a little discipling, maybe for the first time. Say, you know, Pancho, i got to say this, man. If if you're really going to be a follower of Christ, you got to start getting up, be disciplined, and read your Bible and pray. And usually, most people that really, really want it, they go, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And, and you'd be surprised. That little bit of discipling will help to change their character and their life. And once they start getting up in the morning, and once they start having that time, and once they start living a victorious life, they're going to go, wow, this is awesome. I do need my quiet time. Amen, guys? Let's go, James 1. Verse 22. I love this scripture. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Now right here, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is saying, listen, here is what the Word of God is like. It is like a mirror. It is a chance for us to really see ourselves. Now, for some of us, that stops us from getting in there right away, right there, amen? But when we get into the Word of God, We need to just be very humble before God and say, okay, what do I look like? What's going on in my life? See what I'm saying? Now, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, for me, uh, it's kind of, I I have an unusual marriage. My, My wife is a total morning person. She gets up, oh, it's a wonderful day, it's awesome, it's great, and oh, and there I am, I have to feel my way into the bathroom, you know what I'm talking about right here? And, and yet, even in the midst of all that, I know, hold it, when I look in the mirror, I go, wow, I've got some serious work to do. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about right here? You know, my hair is going every which way but loose. And at least I still have some hair, amen? And then, you know, I look at my eyes, they're all like puffy. I'm trying to, you know, scrunch them down there a little bit. And then sometimes you get scuzz. You ever had scuzz on the side of your face or something like that? You know, you go, oh, gross, chick, gun it, man. And, you know, you got, you got, what would happen... If you didn't deal with your hair, what would happen if you didn't deal with the scuzz? And all you do is you look at the mirror and you go, okay, I'm ready for work. And you're all, I'm telling you, that's how a lot of us have quiet times. We look in the scriptures, we go, oh yeah, my hair's all messed up, I'm a mess and I got scuzz on me. Oh, amen. Good. Now, it's now time to go to work. It doesn't impact us. We don't make any decisions. And you've got to explain to Pancho, when you look in the Bible, it's God speaking to you, and you've got to make some decisions. Are you with me here, church? Amen. Well, you know, the bottom line is, why do we even study the Bible? Have you ever thought about that, Pancho? He said, well, I was thinking about that all the way through. <laughs> Let's look at John chapter 12. 
You know, sometimes people worry a bit if they didn't hit every point that uh, we hit. Here. You know, here's the thing, guys. There are so many scriptures in this study that are so awesome. If you forget one sub point, don't worry about it. There's enough in here that's going to keep this non-Christian busy for a long time to come. Oh, yeah. Amen? Amen. And so don't, don't get panicked if you leave out a, a point or a sub point. Just keep teaching the scriptures, go on through it, and the Holy Spirit will make up for what's lost right there. But the question has to come. Why do we study the scriptures? Well, in John 12, in verse 48, it says, There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. Why do we study the word of God? Because the word of God is going to judge us. That is going to be the judge on the day we die. Now, there are some, and you can explain this to your friend, that say, well, that just seems radical. That just seems unfair. And they may not want to say that. They may not verbalize it. But I think it's very good that you try to explain really how generous and how gracious God is. Bottom line, I, I guess, would be like if you were in high school and uh, maybe you're taking like an awesome course like chemistry. You know, something, a, a fun, awesome course. And you sat in the class the entire year and at the end of the year, in, in every course I had in high school, we had a final exam. You remember those babies? And you know, we go, we don't like final exams, but we, we know they're necessary. Because if, if there was no final exam, would we be cranking through the studies, guys? Not most of us. Not most of us. But what if, what if you've been taking chemistry and uh, you come to the end of the year and they hand out the final exam and there you are at your desk and you look at it, write your name, date it, kind of go through each of the pages, you know, and you go, you know something, man, gee, I, I don't. I don't know any of the answers. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, I got to go talk to the teacher. So as everybody else is working, you kind of mosey on up to the teacher. You go, hey, teacher. You know, I, I got to first of all just say you're an awesome teacher. And I, and I got I to secondly say that I have really enjoyed being in the class. I mean, I can honestly say, there's no other teacher like you. Uh, I just have to say that you're awesome. I have a little problem, teacher. This is my exam, and uh, I didn't answer some of the questions. So teacher takes it, and they look at you and say, well... All you did was just put your name and date on it. <laughs> so, well, some, maybe all. So, uh, I, you know, here's, here's the thing. I, I expect probably you're asking why I didn't answer the questions. And I, I want to explain to you firsthand, because I know you're an awesome teacher. <laughs> here's the thing. You know, it's 10th grade. <laughs> And, you know, you got to have a life. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm on the football team oh. and the basketball team. And I play the trumpet. Oh. And, frankly, I have a very demanding dad. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of other things I'm into, yeah. Boy Scouts and stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, honestly, you know what it comes down to? I really wanted to learn chemistry. Oh. And, as I said before, you are awesome. But, you know, the bottom line is I just never got a chance to read the textbook. 
I was just, you know, what it comes down to, I was just so busy doing so many good things. What's that teacher going to say? <laughs> See you next year, right? <laughs> now, guys, we understand that from a human point of view. And God is saying, here's the textbook. There are no surprises, no curveballs. But He fully expects us not just to read it, but to obey it. Amen, guys? And here's the thing. Our final exam, it's open book. But we've got to open it. We've got to obey it. Now, as you go through this thing, you, you hand the sheet back to Poncho and you let him look it on over and prayerfully your handwriting's not near as bad as mine and hopefully it's more legible. But you go through each of the scriptures and you say, okay, what, what, what do you think? 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures inspired by God. What do you think? Amen. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, the Word of God is, is living and active. It's, it's, it's for real. It's a lie. And it cuts. We've got to have a good attitude when we get convicted. 2 Peter 1 talks about, hey, there's no private interpretation of Scripture. God has a clear intent. Yes, men wrote it, but it is what God intended them to say. John 8, remember we talked about, hey, to the Jews who believed, he says, if you want to be a disciple, you've got to hold to my teaching. You've got to obey my teaching. And just because you're sincere in what you believe, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're right. Amen? And then Matthew 15, we talked about following the traditions of men. Versus the Word of God. If you follow the traditions of men, in other words, traditions that contradict the Word of God, says you nullify it, you're a hypocrite, you pay God lip service, your heart's far away from God, and bottom line, your worship is in vain, it doesn't even count. That's pretty serious, amen? And we talked about you've got to watch your life and doctrine. You need both wings of the airplane, right? And then we said, hey, a little discipling, you know, we've got to study the Scriptures, Every day. Amen, First Principles class? Amen. And then James 1, it's a mirror. It shows you what you really like. You don't just look at a mirror and then walk away. That'd be silly. The same thing with the Bible. You can't just study it and then walk away and make no changes or no decisions. But finally, why do we say Scriptures? Because it's going to be our judge. Wow. And then you just simply write at the very bottom. Hey, listen, Pancho, are you willing to follow the Word of God not your feelings, not your traditions, not anything that you've been taught previous to this time by religious teachers, but are you going to follow the Word of God and the Word of God only? Then you just talk. And then prayerfully he says, yes, but the bottom line is you want him to go back and study it on out. And of course, then we would end with a prayer. Amen? And everybody gets a chance to pray because you want them to be talking to God. Guys, I know you're going to be working hard now in the first principles. So let's not disappoint the Lord. Thanks and God bless.